the studios of Penn State Public Broadcasting, this is To the Best of My Knowledge. Good evening, I'm Graham Spanier. Tonight we'll be talking about conventional, alternative, and complementary treatment options for cancer. The American Cancer Society estimates that 600,000 men and women will die this year from some form of cancer. While there is no single formula for successfully fighting cancer, there are more treatment options available today than ever before, and more reason for hope. In the next hour, we'll talk about a wide range of medical approaches and share the best strategies for choosing everything from your doctor to your battle plan. As always, we invite you to join the conversation. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242. And if you're listening on the web, you can reach us via email at response at psu.edu. Now let's meet our guests. Dr. Tom Lochran is a professor of medicine and director of the Penn State Cancer Institute, based at the Penn State Hershey Medical Center, with affiliates at the Mount Nitty Medical Center in State College, and the Lehigh Valley Hospital and Health Network in Allentown. Also with us is Ralph Moss, a leading author and consultant on cancer treatment and alternative cancer therapies. He has written numerous books on the subject of cancer, including a guidebook titled The Moss Reports, which provides consumer information on more than 200 specific kinds of cancer. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Dr. Lochran, 600,000 cancer deaths, that's a big number, that's in the United States this year alone. How would you characterize America's cancer situation? Well, Graham, it is a serious problem. Um, I think it's about ready to supersede heart disease as the number one killer in the United States. However, there is good information, and uh, actually for the very first time ever in the history of the United States, the uh, number of deaths from cancer has decreased. And so I think that's a very significant advance. And I anticipate that that will uh, continue. Mm -hmm. And uh, just mention for us, what are the three or four leading types of uh, cancer that people encounter? Oh, the most common cancers are lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, and then in men, prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Moss, uh, you heard and, and we know that cancer is the second leading cause of death, uh, not too far behind heart disease. Right. Why do we have such a high rate of cancer uh, 35 years after President Nixon declared war on, on cancer? Well, I think we, we have not really managed the war on cancer very well. I think there have been glaring deficiencies. One problem, very big problem, is the smoking situation. Uh, not enough has been done to curb smoking, among, especially among young people. And that's a big, big chunk of the cancer mortality and the cancer incidence in the United States. The American Lung Association ra has rated the different states and the federal government in terms of how well they've conducted the war against tobacco-related cancers. The federal government gets three Fs and a D for its anti-smoking activities. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a, a damning indictment, really, of that a area. We have not put enough money into screening, uh, where screening works. Um, we have not really put the, the funds into that. And I think in the research field, some things have been held back for uh, political or economic reasons. Um, for instance, uh, stem cells. I think that in, there's an inadequate amount of attention. I, I can't really comment about the amount of money, but in terms of the attention, if you go to the National Cancer Institute's website, there's virtually nothing about stem cells. In their 16-page programmatic statement at their website, there's only one mention of stem cells. And I, I personally feel that stem cells uh, cancer stem cells uh, specifically are a major breakthrough in the understanding of cancer and potentially in the treatment of cancer and that shouldn't be held up for political reasons. Mm -hmm. Our telephone number is 1-800-543-8242. If you'd like to get in on this conversation at any time, please do. Questions about any aspect of cancer, cancer treatment, 
alternative approaches to cancer. We welcome your calls. We're going to open up the telephones right now. Francis from State College is already on the line. So, Francis, you've got the first question tonight. Oh, thank you, Dr. Steiner. This question is for your colleague, uh, Dr. Logan. Um, one of your colleagues down at Hershey, uh, uh, Dr. Alan Lipton, has been doing some work with a Pennsylvania company uh, looking at circulating tumor cells. And again, this, I guess, speaks to diagnostics and better therapies. I'm curious, uh, I think it's been around for about two years, how that's transforming, if it is, uh, cancer therapies to the looking at and counting these circulating tumor cells, uh, first in breast cancer, then in colon, and I think eventually prostate cancer. Yes, uh, that's a very interesting question, and you are correct that uh, my colleague, Dr. Lipton, has been doing research in that area, as well as other people across the country. Um, I would say, as of now, it's uh, still experimental in terms of a, a research test, not available uh, at, for clinical use, but it is very exciting, uh, pro probably in the, in the realms of early detection, as well as uh, uh, gauging the effectiveness of treatment. And uh, I'd also like to mention our colleagues here at uh, main campus of Penn State are collaborating with us at Hershey and developing newer ways of detecting circulating stem cells using nanotechnology. And uh, that's also a very promising uh, avenue of pursuit. And uh, could you just explain nanotechnology to those who might not be familiar with it? Right, this is a difficult concept. I think the easiest way of uh, looking at it, it basically refers to a very small molecules. Um, so if you take the diameter of a, a hair, an individual hair particle, nanotechnology is uh, working at a uh, size that's one one thousandth the diameter of an ha individual hair follicle. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, Francis, thank you for your call. And uh, remember, uh, others are welcome to get in on the conversation, 1-800-543-8242. Now, uh, Dr. Moss, uh, you're known for writing about and uh, widely recognized on the subject of alternative pr approaches to cancer. And can you just give us a bit of an overview of uh, what are the alternatives out there? Most individuals would uh, uh, go see their doctor and an, an, an MD, perhaps, and uh, an oncologist who specializes in cancer. And uh, are you there to say there are other things to do <laughs> along the way? Well, I'm, I'm very interested in investigating these other treatments outside the mainstream. And, but my basic perspective is to foster the testing of those treatments. I am not a person who believes that you can jump from a good idea to just implementing, you know, offering that to the public without there being uh, proof of safety and efficacy. So I worked for almost 10 years at the level of the National Institutes of Health trying to foster that, uh, that testing process. Mm -hmm. And now we have about $150 million being spent overall in the, in the field of so-called alternative medicine. Alternative medicine, or com CAM, complementary and alternative medicine, is a kind of grab bag. Uh, you really have in there um, everything from totally fraudulent uh, things to things that are poised for uh, acceptance into conventional medicine. Mm -hmm. And you have to exercise a lot of discrimination as a patient and as a re researcher uh, as to what's worth putting some effort and money into investigating. Give us an example of something that uh, has been proposed in, as an alternative approach that may have some have value. Taken, well, I yeah. think uh, hyperthermia, for instance, the use of heat uh, as an uh, an adjuvant treatment, an additional treatment for cancer. I think, by and large, the clinical trials show um, much better results when you add uh, heat to radiation and somewhat to chemotherapy. Um, uh, in Europe, there is a, a wide array of um, immune modulating substances, immune stimulating substances, based originally on the work of a of a physician in New York named William B. Coley about 100 years ago. Um, and these have shown some promise, for instance, uh, mistletoe extract. Uh, there are some trials showing um, improved quality of life and even some life prolongation. There's a whole set of clinical trials um, in Italy, done in Italy, uh, on the use of melatonin, which is a very inexpensive uh, uh, hormone that can, is actually available over the counter improving the results, again, of conventional therapy. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so those, I think, are things that have demonstrated through uh, rational science that there is some basis for them, and I think that work on those things should be accelerated um, and a lot more effort should be put into them. Dr. Loughran, uh, we've had tremendous success in our country dealing with certain types of cancer. I'm thinking of uh, childhood leukemia as mm -hmm. one where the rates are now astoundingly good compared to yes. where they were maybe just even a generation ago. Right. But other types of cancers, the rates are just not very good, not very promising. Why the divergence? What is it about cancer that in some areas we've seen so much progress and in other areas uh, we still don't have a lot of hope? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. And I think uh, the answer to that is that cancer is a term that's used for a variety of different diseases. And there's probably hundreds of different individual kinds of cancer. Uh, it does seem that most of the hematologic malignancies like leukemias and lymphomas are the ones that respond best. Uh, still today, the best treatment for uh, the more common cancers that we discussed already in the show is uh, really early detection. Obviously, the better thing would be prevention of cancer. Um, but if you are unfortunate to develop cancer, surgical uh, procedures are the best if it's caught early. In terms of why it's different, it's still a, a vast area of research. Um, it's hindered in the solid tumors and, uh, because it's, uh, the actual cancer cells are very inaccessible to researchers. You have to do a, an invasive biopsy to obtain tissue. So part of the explanation perhaps might be that the liquid tumors, the leukemias, for example, are readily available for research and therefore mm -hmm. we're able to make advances more readily. Mm -hmm. uh, our next caller is Jerome, who is on the line from Ludlow. Hello, Jerome. Hi, how are you, Steve? Fine. Yes, um, I'm kind of walking on myself here when I talk about this because I'm a smoker. So, But anyway, uh, I work for a nonprofit agency, and nonprofit agencies in the state of Pennsylvania hand out uh, pamphlets to people when we go to their homes for energy education on secondhand smoke and that type of thing. Uh, and this was brought, these, this information when, and pamphlets were brought about by the class action suit the government had against the tobacco industries for Joe Camel and those type of things. Uh, and I was wondering why, if somebody like myself that is a smoker wanted to go to the doctor or go somewhere and get these medications to help quit smoking, that we have to pay for them, yet, but yet we're just giving out pamphlets for people to read. Wouldn't the money be better off spent, or some of the money better off spent, uh, paying for the uh, uh, programs that, for people who actually want to quit? Mm -hmm. That was my question. Well, well Dr. Moss, edu I mean, education yeah. and prevention is uh, it's a tough issue when it comes to health care reimbursement. It is, uh, because nobody immediately makes money. Off, or maybe the printer makes some money, but other than that, you know, uh, it's not like you're bringing in cash to the hospital. Money spent on prevention and early detection is never wasted. It's never misspent because um, that will pay off tremendous dividends. I mean, just look at the treatment of lung cancer just as an example. Um, and I, I speak here as a good friend of mine is currently struggling with this um, and uh, you know in, with great desperation um, just one drug Avastin uh, which is about to be approved for the treatment of lung cancer the the, the manufacturer Genentech uh, has said in the New York Times that they intend to charge a hundred thousand dollars per year per patient for for that treatment and that's one you know one line of defense other drugs are also being used uh, for that, so the no, the amount of money that's being spent um, on tr each individual case of cancer is now it's not uncommon to see figures of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. For instance, mm -hmm. for colon cancer, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars has been cited as a figure. Uh, prevention, preventing that cancer, is a minuscule fraction of what the cost to society ultimately is for that cancer. So uh, I agree with the caller. I mean, I think it's it would be rational to do both things, to give out the pamphlets, but also to have aggressive programs for um, uh, smoking prevention programs if they're effective. And also, if there are effective ways of doing early diagnosis, that's a debatable issue. But we certainly should be investigating that more thoroughly. I think of. Uh our own university where uh, 
uh, Penn State is the largest employer in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and so we insure uh, our employees and their families, tens of thousands of people. Yeah. With the figures you cite, we could have one heck of an education campaign for all of our employees right. for the cost of treating just one of those just, cases. Just one case, and uh, and the projection in the New York Times was that the, the annual sales in the United States of Avastin, of this one drug, uh, is going to be seven over seven billion, with a B, dollars. Seven billion for that one drug, mm -hmm. and um, I think you'd probably agree with me that that drug has minimal toxic, excuse me, minimal efficacy in, in clinical trials in lung cancer. I mean, some people say two months added survival. I think one could debate that. But, <clears throat> you know, we're talking about palliation at the end of life. We should be talking about prevention at the beginning of life and throughout the, you know, especially the early years because cancer takes quite a while to form. So. Let's w work on it from the point of view of the early detection mm -hmm. of the disease and the early uh, elimination of the disease. Our next caller is Kathleen from Harrisburg. Thanks for being on our program tonight. Good evening. Um, question um, for anyone who cares to answer. Uh, within the last several days, I had a routine mammogram. Um, was asked to come back in. There was some calcification that showed up. About three and a half years ago, I had a major breast reduction done. Um, so obviously my surprise was that they found this calcification. I'm scheduled to go in for a biopsy. Um, and at this point in my head, I can't decide if I should have the biopsy or if I should just go in and have the calcification spot because it is very defined on the mammogram removed and I'm actually just sort of looking for suggestions because I don't know. I mean, I've already had the invasive surgery done to have the reduction done because of a prior um, problem and now I'm facing this again and I just don't know what avenue mm -hmm. to take with this. Dr. Lochran, can you yes, give her uh, some advice? Yes, I'd uh, be glad to answer that question. Um, Basically, uh, calcification is a warning sign. It doesn't necessarily mean that something bad is there, but I agree with the recommendation to get a biopsy. Uh, basically, the biopsy would be right around the area where the calcification is uh, in the breast. So um, the biopsy would be the way that I, I would definitely agree with the, the, that recommendation for a biopsy. Kathleen, is that, uh, is that helpful to you? Okay, I think Kathleen's off the air now. We'll go to our next caller, who's Jake. Jake is calling from Huntington. Good evening, Jake. Hi. My question is about prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like for the, the doctors to uh, discuss and talk about the um, long-term side effects, excuse me, the side effects of long-term uh, hormone deprivation therapy. Uh, I've been on it for 10 years. I don't mean immediate uh, side effects like hot flashes and all those kinds of things. I mean long time term side effects. So let's understand you you have uh, had prostate cancer and you're being treated for it through home hormone therapy? Hormone deprivation therapy. Oh, okay. Can I hang up now? Uh, yes, go ahead and uh, listen for Dr. Lochran's answer on that if you would. Sure. Um, could I ask uh, a question about your Prostate cancer, you had it surgically removed 10 years ago? Is that the. I, I think he may have gotten off the line oh, okay. uh, just to listen uh, to you. Generally, answer. the uh, hormonal manipulation of hormonal therapy is a very standard approach for prostate cancer, and it is very successful with many patients doing very well. Uh, as the caller alluded to, there are some immediate side effects. Long term side effects are uh, not really that significant, uh, in my opinion. Uh, now, the most uh, common treatment for prostate cancer would be the removal of the prostate. Is that right? A radical prostatectomy? Or? Uh, it's uh, it's a tough question. It's a tough call. Um, the surgery has some complications associated with it. It depends on the the grade of the histology of the prostate cancer lesion itself, the the staging workup in terms of whether it's thought to be confined to the prostate. The alternative, besides uh, radical surgery, as you suggest would be local radiation therapy, which mm -hmm. is uh, 
it's like a 50-50 call. It's a tough, tough individual decision. Now he's worried about long-term consequences, it sounded like, from, yes, from can, uh, already 10 years uh, with this uh, hormone deprivation right. treatment and uh, worried about what's going to happen beyond that. Yes, so um, he's obviously had a very good response to his therapy now 10 years later. Um, see if Dr. Moss has any uh, I don't know. I, I don't know of any long-term effects, uh, uh, yeah, adverse so. effects. I've, I've never heard of them. Uh, Dr. Moss, you've mm -hmm. traveled the world, visited clinics, interviewed patients and practitioners, studied all of, all of the data, uh, but uh, tell us how you got onto this topic, because it, if I'm remembering right, your PhD was in literature. Classics. And you moved uh, over to this direction, and uh, yeah. what, what, what pulled you in that direction? In 1974, I was hired at um, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York as a science writer. And um, I was there for almost four years, um, but unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, they had launched a program of testing um, non-conventional uh, treatments for cancer. And um, some of these experiments involved a substance called laetrile or amygdalin, which is a, an extract of apricot kernels. And the, the main researcher on that uh, confided in me that the tests he was doing were positive in nature. They were stopping the spread of cancer. Um, unfortunately, uh, we in public affairs were given instructions to report the opposite of that and I couldn't go along with that and uh, basically parted company with, from them in November of 1977. Mm -hmm. So this uh, piqued my interest, to put it mildly, in, uh, in alternative treatments uh, and I at that point um, wrote my first book which was uh, The Cancer Industry, uh, also called uh, Cancer Syndrome originally. And um, I was trying to understand what had happened uh, in the field of cancer so that some treatments were designated um, alternative treatments and some treatments were designated uh, approved or conventional treatments. And that's been sort of my, my life work, I would say, f uh, for 30 odd years. So it's a, it is a strange transition from mm -hmm. uh, Petronius' Satyricon to, uh, you know, um, malignant stem cells, but uh, it makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for, for filling us in on that. Yeah. Our next caller is Rose from Altoona. Hi, Rose. Hi. Um, yeah, I have a question. My mother just died two months ago from lung cancer, mm. and we had put the fentanyl patches, fentanyl patches on her, and like what, the minute we put them on her, she started going downhill. And like three days later, she was dead. Now I wonder if we would, if we would have put the fentanyl patches on her, would there have been a chance that her life would have prolonged a little bit longer without the patches, or did that accelerate it? Dr. Lochran, uh, tell us what a sentinel patch is and uh, how you would answer her question. To be honest, I'm not sure exactly what a sentinel patch might be. It could be uh, possibly for. For narcotic relief? Yeah, for yeah, like, like uh, pain, but she didn't even uh, have any pain. Uh, like a fentanyl patch, yeah. perhaps? Fentanyl, that's probably ah, yeah. Fentanyl, okay. Yeah, fentanyl patch is a narcotic. Um, so I would uh, basically reassure you, and I'm sorry that uh, your relative passed away, but I can definitely reassure you that that uh, had no effect on the course of her, uh, of her life. Um, the reason they gave that, presumably, was uh, for palliation, and the, your physician, her physician judged that she needed uh, some continual release of narcotics. But she didn't have no pain, though. That's what I was wondering. They put the one on her, and then they had to put the other one on her. And maybe I thought maybe it might have been like an overdose type thing, too much for her. Uh, that's a good qu common question for uh, the f patients and relatives related to cancer. And, uh, you know, the question being, is there any possibility of getting addicted to the narcotics that we administer for our patients? And uh, our, our answer is reassuringly no. So not knowing the details uh, related to your, um, to your mom, I, I can't really comment other than to say I'm, I'm, I'm sure that 
it really had no impact on her or her lifespan. Thanks for your call, Rose. Our next caller is also from Altoona. Jane, you're on the air. Hi. Yeah, thanks for taking my call. Um, my father was uh, recently diagnosed with prostate cancer, inoperable prostate cancer, and they have started hormone treatments a couple months ago, and he started radiation uh, a couple weeks ago. He's going into radiation five days a week for about eight weeks, 42 treatments. Mm -hmm. And um, I've heard that uh, if the radiation doesn't work, um, they can't do radiation again. And I'm just wondering about the statistics for prostate mm -hmm. cancer, radiation treatment, uh, the success rates, and what happens if the radiation doesn't work. Uh, you might tell us, Dr. Lochran, first of all, why uh, a prostate cancer might be inoperable, uh, declared that when it's detected. Is it because it's spread beyond the prostate? and? The surgery itself is not going to help, and ra um, radiation is the treatment? Uh, you, those are good questions. And when we say uh, inoperable, uh, it could mean t one of two things. It could mean, as you're alluding to, Graham, that the cancer is spread beyond the uh, site of disease. Or alternatively, it might be such that the operation itself is hard to do. Prostate cancer, that's usually not applicable. But where it's more common is in lung cancer where if uh, patients had you know, heavy cigarette smoking exposure, they can't withstand taking out an entire segment of their lung. So mm -hmm. in this case, it probably most likely means that the uh, disease is spread beyond the capsule of the prostate. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the uh, prognosis, I really can't comment without knowing a lot more details of the individual case. Uh, in terms of the delivery of the radiation therapy, there's a variety of different ways of doing that now. Uh, particularly uh, seed implants to give a little bit higher concentration of the radiation to the actual tumor. Mm -hmm. And are the uh, the seed implants for radiation becoming increasingly common and gaining ground on the, the surgical solution? Uh, again, it's the dependent on an individual case and there is a large debate in the um, medical oncology field in terms of whether surgery or radiation therapy is the appropriate first treatment. Mm -hmm. And that really is decided on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. However, there are lots of recent advances in radiation therapy in terms of the actual dose delivery and the way of administering higher doses of radiation directly to the tumor and then sparing the uh, normal tissue. This is to the best of my knowledge on WPSU TV and FM and the Pennsylvania Cable Network. I'm Graham Spanier, president of Penn State, and if you're just joining us, we're talking about a wide range of medical approaches to fighting cancer. Our guests are Dr. Tom Lochran, a professor of medicine and director of the Penn State Cancer Institute at the Penn State Milton S. Hershey Medical Center, and Ralph Moss, a leading author and consultant on cancer treatment and alternative cancer therapies. If you have questions or comments for our guests, give us a call. Our number is 1-800-543-8242. Or if you prefer email, drop us a line at response at psu.edu. We're going to try to get to as many questions as we can. Our next caller is Jody from Huntington. Hello, Jody. Thanks for calling in. Hi. Thank you for this program tonight. Um, I have a question. Um, a lot of talk was about early diagnosis and prevention. Mm -hmm. um, I, have, I had a father who died of cancer and my mother was just diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. My question is, why do the insurance companies fight anyone who wants to do preventative medicine, such as myself? You know, yearly do a PET scan, um, an MRI, or whatever it would take to say, okay, you're cancer-free, or we caught it in the early stages. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Moss, you took a stab at that one earlier. Maybe you can uh, direct mm -hmm. it a little more in, uh, towards her particular question. Well, I, I think uh, I agree with the thrust of the, of the question. I think that, as I said, um, money spent on prevention is, not, uh, is never ill-spent. Um, a PET scan, I think, would be a little extreme to do uh, in this case if you didn't um, have any active sign of cancer. And of course, you know, things like PET scans are wonderful tools, but they're rather expensive. It's over a thousand dollars for a PET scan. But I, I think, um, as a general rule, more needs to be done, and we need more, m much more research into um, 
uh, less expensive way, ways of telling whether or not a person has cancer, biochemical tests, for instance, and genetic tests. Mm -hmm. So I agree with the, the basic idea, although I'm not sure I would agree about every person getting a PET scan. That would sort of tie up our all the, the, the resources we have for treating people, using PET scans for people who ha mm -hmm. already are known to have cancer. Thank you. Uh, Beth from Altoona, you are on the air. Yes, I'd like to ask you if you're familiar with the alternative cancer treatment called Protocell, formerly called Cancel. And yeah. an additional question, um, if your oncologist well, refuses to treat you, other than with conventional methods such as chemo and radiation, and you would like to use an alternative form of cancer treatment, namely the protocell. Um, how do you convince them to let you do that? And are there doctors, oncologists in the Blair County, Cambria County area that you know would treat a patient who would elect to use an alternative form of cancer treatment? Dr. Moss? Well, I am. Um I was on the, the NIH panel, the pharmacological and biological um, review panel in 1992 that reviewed Cancel. And um, I must say that I was, uh, I was very disappointed in the, the data that was presented to us by the people in Michigan who had developed this. I mean, basically, um, there was no data. Uh, they, they told me that I could come to Michigan and look through uh, some boxes, uh, some shoe boxes full of letters of testimonials, but you know it was really a kind of a sad uh, presentation. And I, I tell you the truth, um, I don't understand the the philosophy behind can't sell. Although I've certainly read you know almost everything I could get my hands on, and I tend to regard that as a kind of urban myth. So if you're looking for you know some complementary or alternative treatment. I wouldn't discourage you by any means, but I think that you should uh, try to find those treatments that are more scientifically based, um, and there are some, um, and there are, there's a whole category of things that really are just not very well documented. They don't really have uh, much credibility, and I would, sh I would shy away from those. But as, as far as where do you find uh, sympathetic oncologists, there are some. I don't know about in your county, but I would say around the country uh, there are doctors. A lot of them are affiliated with a journal that I'm involved with called Integrative Cancer Therapies, um, uh, which is edited from, by people at the University of Illinois, and they can be found. And if you wanted to, you could go to my website, which is cancerdecisions.com, and you'll find a lot of references to uh, integrative oncologists there. Thank you for your call, Beth. Edith is uh, next uh, on the phone lines with us. She's calling from Half Moon Township. Hello, Edith. Hello. My question is, what are the early signs of lung cancer, and are x-rays alone enough to make a determination of it? Mm -hmm. Dr. Lochran? Yes. Uh, well, one of the problems with lung cancer, as most of the other solid tumors, is that uh, it, by the time it's discovered, it's usually discovered as a late event. So for that reason, the lungs occupy such a large volume that patients often do not have symptoms uh, until late in the course of their diagnosis. However, the symptoms that people can present would be things like chronic cough that's persistent, never goes away. Uh, hoarseness of your voice, uh, chest pain, those type of symptoms. Edith, is that helpful to you? And uh, the other part was, mm -hmm. do chest x-rays alone? Chest x-rays. Yeah, do they show enough? Uh, right, so uh, this came up earlier in terms of what best, what kind of best test would be used for prevention of cancer. And uh, as Dr. Moss alluded to, it's a question of uh, of how sensitive and specific a test might be. Uh, for lung cancer, um, people are exploring the use of a special form of CAT scan called a spiral CT, which has a much more finer discrimination uh, uh, in terms of the individual thickness of the slices examined on the, on the machine. Uh, but still the standard, if, if a patient is uh, is uh, if there's a suspicion of lung cancer raised, the, the, the plain film x-ray of the lung is still the standard. There hasn't been anything really remarkably better 
yet uh, out there. Robert from State College, you're next. Yes, I would like to expand on the uh, question and answer in regard to the long-term effects of hormone deprivation therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, the short-term effects were alluded to and certainly are hot flashes and decreased libido and sexual capacity and, 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 perma and even permanent suppression of testosterone uh -huh. production. However, on the long term, it was, there was no clear answer, I didn't think, and, and I'd like to expand and say that there is, can be muscle wasting, there can be decreased strength and energy uh, of the male who is, has uh, cancer of the prostate and is on long-term hormone deprivation. It, there can be osteoporosis with uh, vertebral body collapse and, and fractures of uh, long bones. There can also be decreased mental capacity and acuity and a change in the muscle fat ratio within the body as well as obvious long-term loss of libido. Uh, so I just thought that that needed to be expanded. Uh -huh. Well, stay on the line for a moment, Robert. Uh, the question, uh, that's a good comment, the question I would ask uh, you and have Robert comment on it is um, while there may be some downside uh, effects like that, uh, how do you weigh the risks and benefits of being on it or not? Presumably, the gentleman who called earlier was uh, was put on that that uh, course of treatment for a reason relating to the prostate. Right. So, um, appreciate the comments from the caller. Uh, prostate cancer is not my individual specialty. Mm -hmm. I deal in leukemias and lymphomas. However, I am board certified in oncology. So, uh, the. The, call, the caller really does note some important long-term side effects, particularly the osteoporosis, which is a weakening of the bones. Um, that can be uh, followed by doing densitometry and additional stre bone strengthening medications can be given uh, if it's uh, deemed uh, that there's a significant loss of bone. Mm -hmm. And of course it goes without saying in any situation that in individuals uh, variables are going to differ from other individuals and have to be taken into account, I'm sure, uh, any right. individual treatment plan. Yes, that's, uh, that's definitely true. And, and uh, if I uh, surmise the uh, initial caller right, if he's been on this therapy for 10 years, that's a remarkably long time and that would mean he's had a very beneficial response uh, in terms of the control of his uh, prostate cancer. Mm -hmm which is, you know, the most important thing to get under control. Robert, thanks for your call. Uh, Corrine from Belfont, you're with us uh, <coughs> on the air. Thanks for joining us tonight. Hello, thank you. Um, I'd like to preface my remarks by saying that I am talking from both ends of the healthcare spectrum. I'm a nurse practitioner, and I've also had uh, a number of episodes of breast cancer myself. I <laughs> I've lost count. I think maybe it's eight by now. Um, and I wanted to um, add some responses to the call and the questions from Rose of Altoona. Um, I don't recall which of you um, spoke to her concerns, um, and I'm sure you allayed her fears about such things as addiction, but I'm not entirely sure that that was her major concern. I. I thought that what I was hearing was some worry on her part that by giving her mother that fentanyl, she may have shortened her life because mm -hmm. her mother may have seemed more drowsy or less responsive. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, she may have been more relaxed and more drowsy while taking the fentanyl and or while, while using it in the form of a patch. Mm -hmm. um, and that may have made her seem as though she was slipping, but indeed her disease perhaps uh, was at a stage where the use of the fentanyl allowed her to relax enough during that process to, to feel comfortable and very, very sleepy. It was also not terribly uncommon for a person to not want to worry their family members, the people that they love, and they will say, no, no, I don't have any pain, but they will tell their doctor something different. And so the ordering of the fentanyl patch and then the increase in the dosage of the fentanyl makes me wonder if such a phenomenon might have been going on and, and Rose's mother was really working very 
carefully to spare her relatives from worrying about her. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a very insightful mm -hmm. comment um, and, and probably a, a possible scenario for, for what happened. We don't, we don't know, but I think it's a very insightful way of looking at it. I think uh, as an overall co uh, comment that the withholding of pain relieving medication is a bigger problem in our society than giving too much pain oh, relieving. Yeah. We have a, there is a kind, as part of the, the war on drugs, I think that there is an aversion uh, to uh, medicating people in this country and in Europe as well, I understand. Um, and sometimes people suffer unnecessarily um, uh, where the pain could be relieved. And that the idea that um, people who are in late stages of cancer, who are in pain, are going to become uh, dependent or addicted to um, narcotics seems to me to be an absurd uh, position. Yeah, um, it, seems, it seems to be the, the wrong issue. If they do become addicted, what does it matter? If they become more comfortable, that is the issue. I would think that that's true, and, and we know that, I mean, the two things patients want out of treatment is prolongation of survival uh, and improvement in quality of life. And if you can improve quality of life with, by any means, I, and I would include, my personally would include any narcotic drug that uh, the government may disapprove of, um, then that they have that right and and necessity to get that. Kareen, thank you for your question and uh, your comment, and we appreciate that. And I, I want to uh, read an email here uh, and ask Dr. Lochran to, to comment on it. Uh, this is from uh, Jerry saying, uh, my sister was diagnosed with rectal cancer in November of last year. She underwent four weeks of radiation and chemotherapy, followed by an operation to remove the cancer. Mm -hmm. The surgeon removed the cancer tumor, tumor along with surrounding lymph. The lab found only one cancer cell in the lymph. Currently, she is being told by one of her doctors to undergo a year of chemotherapy and being cautioned by a second doctor of the possible dangers of doing this. So here's a family getting some com conflicting device, and uh, the question is what, what options are available to her? Okay, that's, uh, again, not knowing all the details, uh, can't make any particular recommendations. I can make some general comments. The first thing I would uh, really emphasize is uh, if, you, if anyone has a diagnosis of cancer, they should uh, get a confirmation of the diagnosis and a confirmation of a plan of treatment at a major cancer center. Uh, and uh, I think that would help out if there's any conflict in this case between the different recommendations of the physicians. Uh, the second point is um, just a comment on the treatment that she received. The, um, the original therapy before surgery is given, that's called neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, the idea there is to shrink the tumor, uh, therefore possibly allowing the surgery to be more successful and, and enabling the surgery to capture all the tumor. Um, that was done, and then at pathology, apparently they still found some residual cancer in the lymph node. Um, and uh, I would actually, not knowing all the details, I would be inclined to agree with the first recommendation, where if there's uh, all the cancers taken out, but there was evidence on pathology of some residual cancer, um, the additional year of treatment would be called adjuvant chemotherapy. The idea there is you're now cancer-free, the additional chemotherapy is given to try to prevent it from ever coming back. So I'm inclined to go with the first recommendation, but again, not knowing the details, my major mm -hmm. recommendation is to seek a, an opinion of the major cancer center. Uh, speaking of major cancer centers, uh, knowing that we have several callers uh, still in the queue and we want to try to get to them, uh, I want to make sure we don't run out of time uh, and uh, have you uh, the opportunity to uh, talk about the Penn State Cancer Center a little bit about what's happening there and maybe about the new building and how that ties into the uh, Mount Nittany Medical Center and some of mm -hmm. our other partners. Just a brief overview. Yes, I'm glad to have an opportunity to talk about this. Um, as you know, I was recruited almost three years ago to become the director. And uh, we, uh, the idea of the Penn State Cancer Institute is uh, to uh, reach out to central and northeast Pennsylvania areas that are not covered by Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. So our founding partners uh, do include the Mount Nittany Medical Center here in State College, the Lehigh Valley Health System in Allentown, and we have some newer affiliates based in Williamsport and uh, Scranton-Wilkes-Barre. Mm -hmm. And uh, our idea is uh, 
where our goal is to uh, offer state-of-the-art care for patients, but also uh, modern research. And I wanted to emphasize, I, I personally believe the area of cancer prevention is very important. And uh, we had an opportunity to recruit a group of uh, faculty and scientists from the former Institute for Cancer Prevention. Uh, before that, it was called the American Health Foundation, which was the, uh, really the ground bacon institute in the country for this whole area of cancer prevention. So the Penn State Cancer Institute, uh, one of its main goals is to foster research in, into cancer mm -hmm. prevention. Now we have several callers in the queue, so we're just going to uh, pick and choose a couple of them and uh, make sure we get you in. I'd like to go next to uh, James, who's calling from Derby. Hello, James. Uh, let's put you on the air with your question. Uh, yes, uh, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2003, December, and uh, I was I was given. Um, PSA uh, over a period of five to six years, my PSA went from two point uh, from four point two to uh, four point six, and eventually six fourteen. I was given a biopsy. I had about five biopsies, and I was it was determined on my last biopsy that I had um, five percent of prostate cancer in one cell. Um, before my treatment, which was radiation. I was given a um, a uh, sperm test, not a sperm test, but a um, seeded uh, test, and it was supposed to be like two months. How much did that play in the part of my uh, recovering from cancer? Uh, today, my uh, prostate reading is like um, 2.0, 0 0.2. 0 0.2. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, 0 0.2 is a very good score. I mean, that's almost undetectable in terms of PSA. So for the general audience, PSA is a biological test, kind of a surrogate marker for prostate cancer activity. It does go up uh, in terms of the levels uh, based on age. So uh, a PSA always has to be interpreted in the context of how old the individual is and whom the test was performed. Um, but it is certainly very good news that the PSA has decreased uh, to that mm -hmm. degree and would lead me to conclude that the treatment you had was very successful. And here's a bit of trivia. The PSA test was developed by a Penn State alum, oh. one of our oh, uh, great. Uh, students who got a master's and a doctoral degree here and is, uh, we're, we're very proud of that. Uh, let's now uh, go to uh, Bob from Eckland. Hello, Bob. We'll squeeze you in here real fast. Thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed uh, about 15 years ago and had a, a mole removed from my right forearm that was melanoma. I'm having a follow-up now uh, with an oncologist looking at two suspicious other moles on my uh, legs. But uh, Sloan Kettering has a test uh, called uh, reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, which can detect a single melanoma cell among 10 million circulating blood cells. If I were to take that test and it turned out I had that, how would my follow-up change now? Okay, uh, that's a good question too, and it kind of emphasizes the newer techniques available, particularly from the molecular point of view, uh, that we're now able to um, have tests available that can detect, that are very sensitive in terms of the one in thousand. However, I would like to emphasize uh, that that test, as far as I know, it doesn't have any basis for making clinical decisions. So you still would need to proceed with uh, whatever the recommendations are for the, for the two moles that you would have, in my opinion. And Dr. Moss, uh, real quickly, what's uh, next for you? You must have a project brewing. I'm going to the Czech Republic. I'm going to be investigating a treatment with the use of proenzymes in the treatment of cancer. Great. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us tonight, and apologies to all of the people, all the callers and viewers in the queue, and those who have sent emails that we haven't had a chance to get to. I think we could go on for another couple of hours. <laughs> Tonight's program will be stored in an electronic archive that can be accessed through WPSU.org. This site also links to online resources on tonight's topic. 
Thanks to our guest, Dr. Tom Lochran, a professor of medicine and director of the Penn State Cancer Institute, based at the Penn State Hershey Medical Center, and Ralph Moss of State College, part-time. He's an author and consultant on cancer treatment and alternative cancer therapies. Thanks to both of you for joining us tonight. And we hope you'll join us for the next edition of To the Best of My Knowledge. To the Best of My Knowledge is a production of Penn State Public Broadcasting. And for all of us here at Penn State Public Broadcasting, I'm Graham Spanier. Good night. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.